Ahang bante, tisaranena saha pancha, sila niachami. Dutiampi ahang bante, tisaranena saha pancha, sila niachami. Tatiampi ahang bante, tisaranena saha pancha, sila niachami. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa. 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 Namo tassa bhagavato arahato Sama Sambudasa Namo Tasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambudasa Buddhang Saranang Gachami Buddhang Saranang Gachami Dhammang Saranang Gachami Dhammang Saranang Gachami Sanghang Saranang Gachami Sangang Saranang Gachami Dutiampi Buddhang Saranang Gachami Dutiampi Buddhang Saranang Gachami Dutiampi Dhammang Saranang Gachami Dutiampi Dhammang Saranang Gachami Dutiampi Sanghang Saranang Gachami Dutiampi Sangang Saranang Gachami Tatiampi Buddhang Saranang Gachami Tatiampi Buddhang Saranang Gachami Tatiampi Dhammang Saranang Gachami Tatiampi Dhammang Saranang Gachami Tatiampi Sangang Saranang Gachami Tatiampi Sanghang Saranang Gachami Ti Saranagamanang Nititang Pama Bante Pana Tipata Viranam Sikha Padang Samadhyami Pana Tipata Viramani Sikha Padang Samadhyami Adinna dana vedaman sikha padang samadhyam. Adinna dana vedaman ni sikha padang samadhyam. Kami su mitha chara vedaman ni sikha padang samadhyam. Kami su mitha chara vedaman ni sikha padang samadhyam. Musava da vedam sikha padang samadhyami. Musava da vedam ni sikha padang samadhyami. Surame raya manja pamada kana vedam ni sikha padang samadhyami. Surame raya manja pamada kana. Vedamani Sikha Padang Samadhyami Imani Pancha Sikha Padani Silena Sukatingyanti Silena Bhoga Sampada Silena Nibutingyanti Tasma Silang Sodhati Sadhu 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 Hundred and forty Tatu Bibanga Sutta, the exposition of the elements. Thus have I heard on one occasion the blessed one was wandering in Magadan country and eventually arrived at Rajagaha. There he went to the potter Bhagawa and said to him, if it is not convenient for you, Bhagava, I will stay one night in your workshop. It is not inconvenient for you, Venerable Sir, but 
It is not incumbent for me, venerable sir, but there is a homeless one already staying there. If he agrees, then stay as long as you like, venerable sir. Now there was a clansman named Pukusati who had gone forth from home life into homelessness out of faith in the Blessed One. And on that occasion, he was already staying in Potter's workshop, comment 1264. According to M.A., Pukusati had been the king of Takcheshila and had entered into friendship with King Bimbisara of Magadha through merchants who travel between two countries for purpose of trade. In an exchange of gifts, Bimbisara sent Pukusati a golden plate on which he had inscribed description of the three jewels and various aspects of the Dhamma. When Pukusati read the inscription, he was filled with joy and decided to renounce the world. Without taking formal ordination, he saved his head, put on yellow robes, and left the palace. He went to Rajaga, intending to meet the Buddha, who was then in Savati, about 300 miles away. The Buddha saw Pukusati with his clear, clairvoyant knowledge and recognizing his capacity to attend the paths and fruits. He journeyed along on foot to Rajaga to meet him. To avoid being recognized by an act of will, the Buddha caused his special physical attributes such as marks of great man to be concealed and he appeared just like an ordinary wandering monk. He arrived at Potter's shed shortly after Pukusati had arrived there intending to leave for Savati the next day in order to meet the Buddha. Then the Blessed One went to Venerable Pukusati and said to him, if it is not inconvenient for you, Viku, I will stay one night in the workshop. The potter's workshop is large enough, friend. Comment 1265. Pukusati, unaware that the new arrival is Buddha, addressed him by the familiar appreciations of Uso. Let the venerable one stay as long as he likes. Or and then the Blessed One entered the potter's workshop, prepared a spread of grass at one end, and sat down, folding his legs crosswise, setting his body erect, and establishing mindfulness in front of him. Then the Blessed One spent most of the night seated in meditation, and the Venerable Pukusati also spent most of the night seated in meditation. Then the Blessed One thought, this clansman conducts himself in a way that inspires confidence. Suppose I were to question him. So he asked the venerable Pukusati, Under whom have you gone forth, Bhikkhu? Who is your teacher? Whose dharma do you profess? Woman 1266. M.A. The Buddha asked these questions merely as a way to start a conversation as he already knew what Pukusati had gone forth on account of himself. Friend, there's the recluse Gotama, the son of the Sakyans, who went forth from the Sakyan clan. Now a good report of that blessed Gotama has been spread to this effect. That blessed one is accomplished, fully enlightened, perfect in true knowledge and conduct, sublime, Knower of worlds, incomparable leader of persons to be tamed, teacher of gods and humans, enlightened, blessed. I have gone forth under the blessed one. That blessed one is my teacher. I profess the Dhamma of that blessed one. But Bhikkhu, where is that blessed one, accomplished and fully enlightened, now living? There is, friend, 
a city in the northern county, country named Sawati. The Blessed One, accomplished and fully enlightened, is now living there. But Bhikkhu, have you ever seen the Blessed One before? Would you recognize him if you saw him? No, friend, I have never seen that Blessed One before, nor would I recognize him if I saw him. Just a question. Um, Bhante, then how can he say that he went forth in Blessed One's dispensation if uh, both they never met? But uh, if they if they never met, then uh, did he hear the Dhamma somewhere? Or like, how can we say that? From the golden sheets, I guess, that was sent to him, according to the commentary. And there was Dhamma on them. Yes, the sheets contain uh, the nine virtues of the Buddha and uh, description of the triple gem and also how to do Anapanasati meditation. According to the story, he, at that point he had already attained the fourth jhana after practicing, according to that. So, okay, so this was, this was uh, in the commentary that uh, Amar just read? Yes. Six. Then the Blessed One thought, This clansman has gone forth from the home life into homelessness under me. Suppose I were to teach him the Dharma. So the Blessed One addressed the Venerable Pukusatni thus, Piku, I will teach you the Dharma. Listen and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, friend, the Venerable Pukusati replied. The Blessed One said this, Piku, this person consists of six elements, six phases of contact, and eighteen kinds of mental exploration, and he has four foundations. Note 1267 says, M.A. Since Pukusati had already purified the preliminary practice of the path, and was able to attain the fourth jhana through mindfulness of breathing, the Buddha began directly with a talk, talk on insight meditation, expounding the ultimate voidness that is the foundation for arahantship. <coughs> End of note. The tides of conceiving do not sweep over one who stands upon these foundations, and when the tides of conceiving no longer sweep over him, he is called a sage at peace. One should not neglect with wisdom, should perceive truth, should cultivate relinquishment, and should train for peace. This is the summary of the exposition of the six elements. Uh, I have a question. What is meant by the ulti ultimate voidness as the foundation of uh, arahantship. Um, it may just mean the the characteristics of vipassana uh, all the way up to emptiness. It's not I mean, the, the emptiness is the, the third characteristic, empty of self, empty of substance. So it may be referring to the third characteristic. Oh, okay. uh, yeah, sunyata is usually, usually related to... It's a commentarial term. I mean, this isn't coming from the Buddha himself, so I'm not. It, it, there may be a way that they use that But it could just mean the third care, uh, like uh, all of the three characteristics, including the third one. But the third one is non self, it's not exactly sunyata. So, yeah. Padatana Buddha. Ante, could it be related to a moment of cessation, the, uh, expounding the ultimate voidness? Uh, 
Well, it's actually here an adjective of, of lakana, vipassana lakana. So it is talking about the explanation that follows, which uh, from that we can say that it is talking about anatta. Eight. Biko, this person consists of six elements. Commentary. One, two, six, eight. M.A. Here the Buddha expounds the non-truly existent by way of the truly existent. For the elements are truly existent, but the person is not truly existent. This is meant. That which you perceive as a person consists of six elements. Ultimately, there is no person here. Person is a uh, person is a mere concept. So it was said, and with reference to what was this said, there are the earth element, the water element, the fire element, the air element, the space element, and the consciousness element. So it was with reference to this that it was said, Biku, this person consists of six elements. Nine. Biko. This person consists of six bases of contact. So it was said. And with reference to what was this said, there are the base of eye contact, the base of ear contact, and the base of nose contact, the base of tongue contact, the base of body contact, and the base of mind contact. So it was with reference to this that it was said, Biko, this person consists of six bases of contact. 10. Biko, this person consists of 18 kinds of mental exploration. Commentary 1269, as at MN 137.8. So it was said, and with reference to what was it said, on seeing a form with the eye, one explores a form produ productive of joy, one explores a form productive of grief, one explores a form productive of equanimity. On hearing a sound with the, with the ear, on smelling an odor with the nose, on tasting a flavor with the tongue, on touching a tangible with the body. On cognizing a mind object with the mind, one explores a mind object productive of joy, one explores a mind object productive of grief, one explores a mind object productive of equanimity. So it was with reference to this that it was said, because this person consists of 18 kinds of mental exploration. 11. Biku. This person has four foundations, so it was said. And with reference to what was this said, there are the foundation of wisdom, the foundation of truth, the foundation of relinquishment, and the foundation of peace. Note 1270. Anya Dittana, Satcha Dittana, Chaga Dittana, Upasama Dittana, Nyanamoli and MS at first rendered aditana as result and then replaced it with mode of expression, neither of which seems suitable for this context. M.A. glosses the word with patita, which clearly means foundation and explains the sense of statement thus. This person who consists of the six elements, the six bases of contact and the 18 kinds of mental approach, when he turns away from these and attains arahantship, the supreme accomplishment he does so established upon these four bases. The four foundations will be individually elucidated by the sequel. So it was with reference to this that it was said, Iku, this person has four foundations. One should not neglect wisdom, should preserve truth, should cultivate cultivate relinquishment and should train for peace. Note 1271 MA from the start from the start one should not neglect the wisdom born of concentration and insight in order to penetrate 
through the wisdom of the fruit of arahantship. One should preserve truthful speech in order to realize Nibbana, the ultimate truth. One should cultivate the relinquishment of defilements in order to relinquish all defilements by the path of arahantship. From the start, from the start, one should train in the pacification of defilements in order to pacify all defilements by the path of arahantship. Thus, the wisdom, etc., born of serenity and insight, are spoken of as the preliminary foundations for achieving the foundation, foundations of wisdom, etc., a distinctive arahantship. So it was said. And with reference to what was this said? How, Bhikkhu, does one not neglect wisdom? Note 1272, MA, the non-neglecting of wisdom is explained by, the, by way of the meditation on the elements. The analysis of the elements here is identical with what that of MN 28.6, 11, 16, 21, and MN 62.8 to 12. There are these six elements, the earth element, the water element, the fire element, the air element, the space element, and the consciousness element. What, Bhikkhu, is the earth element? The earth element may be either internal or external. What is the internal earth element? Whatever internally belonging to oneself is solid, solidified and clung to, that is, head hairs, body hairs, nails, teeth, skin, flesh, sinews, bones, bone marrow, kidneys, heart, liver, diaphragm, spleen, lungs, intestines, mesentery, contents of the stomach, feces, or whatever else internally belonging to oneself, is solid, solidified and clung to. This is called the internal earth element. Now, both the internal element and the external earth element are simply earth element. And that should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom does. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. When one sees it thus as it actually is, with proper wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with the earth element and makes the mind dispassionate towards the earth element. 15. What bhikkhu is the water element? The water element may be either internal or external. What is the internal water element? Whatever internally belonging to oneself is water, watery, and clung to, that is, bile, phlegm, pus, blood, sweat, fat, tears, grease, spittle, snot, oil of the joints, urine, or whatever else internally belonging to oneself is water watery, and clung to. This is called the internal water element. Now both the internal water element and the external water element are simply water element. And that should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom does. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. When one sees it thus, as it actually is with proper wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with the water element and makes the mind dispassionate towards the water element. So just to go back to the question about Achanta Sunyata, the, the, their sub-commentary has a note about it, I think actually in another instance, and not, in, not for this sutta, but for another sutta. Um, and it, yeah, it 
confirms, or it says what makes a lot of sense that it refers to basically all three characteristics. If you think of the character, three characteristics of vipassana, they are negatives, they are absences. Even dukkha, we translate as suffering, but it really is to be understood as the absence of the ability to satisfy or the, the absence of, of happiness. I mean, meaning that it's uh, to dispel the the the, the mis uh, understanding that it can satisfy either by fixing bad things or by um, retaining good things that somehow you can be satisfied or some some others have not to even really just with satisfaction but just to put it bluntly happiness this thing can't make you happy and it's to dispel that it's so sunyata the the, the absence or the complete lack is just referring to that. So it's a bit misleading. The the note, the way it's translated in the, in the English, that's why it evoked the question, but it really is not just referring to vipassana. It's referring to the three characteristics, which can be described as achanta sunyata. There's one place where it um, puts in contrast to the samatha attainments, which don't involve this complete understanding of, of, of total uh, absence of, of being worth clinging to, basically. Meaning when, when you practice samatha, you're not, don't perceive it that way. There's a, still a, often a sense of satisfaction, of control, and uh, uh, stability, right? It feels very stable, and you think, oh, uh, Here's something that is stable, still possible to, to not, you won't see the three characteristics clearly in practicing that, that type of meditation. Thank you, Banta. Um, just, just before we go further, I, I have a question about, uh, from the paragraph 12. I was just a little bit um, confused. Uh, it says, uh, not neglect wisdom, preserve truth, should cultivate relinquishment, and should train for peace. So can you can you say something about this um, four things, Bante? Not really. I mean, he's explaining them here. Yeah, yes. So um, I... Th I th for some reason, I thought that truth and maybe wisdom uh, is are the same, but it says in the commentary that it's it's about uh, uh, speaking truth, the truth. So basically, not lying, I guess. It's quite a, a poetic uh, phrasing. I mean, it's very powerful. The 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 sound. Um, the way it said, Panyang Napamajaya, Satcham Manurakaya, Chaga Manubruheya, Sati Meva Sosikaya. It's very quotable in Pali. So he's with, with Panya, he's, he's Panya Napamajaya. I mean, this very loaded because Appamada, Appamada is very much the cornerstone of the Buddha's teaching. He uses this word. Quite uh, in quite important ways to describe, uh, to allude to actual practice. So it's it, it's a bit deceptive to just say it's not it's um, to not neglect it, but um, I mean that's literally how you could translate it. But it it is a word that it it means being actually um, directly. Perceiving it, I mean, it refers to sati. The Buddha would often say that uh, sati is what means apamada, panyang napamajaya. I'm not quite sure that it should be translated uh, literally as um, not neglecting wisdom, because that sounds kind of funny, doesn't it? Or I mean, it sounds quite specific, like don't forget about wisdom kind of thing. But it's more, I think, that it's more about referring to the relationship between mindfulness and wisdom. When you pay attention, you will see clearly. Like the banya here might be used as a, a, a adverb, like 
uh, you the apamada with wisdom or towards wisdom, that kind of thing. Yeah, towards actually, because it's the object of the verb. So you cultivate mindfulness towards wisdom. I may be reading a little too much into it, but it's not quite it's not quite the neglecting about wisdom, I don't think. It's more about not being not being generally heedless in a way that relates to wisdom, like in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a meditative way, because you can be upamada in other ways, like you, you could be negligent and uh, in terms of, in relation to work or family or that kind of thing. So I think the word, the use of the word panya here is actually meant to refer to in terms of ultimate, in terms of, of what's really important to be not negligent about, which is, reality experience okay thank you Bhante. 16 what bhikkhu is the fire element the fire element may be either internal or external what is the internal fire element whatever internally belonging to oneself is fire fiery and clung to that is that by which one is warmed ages and is consumed and that by which what is eaten drunk, consumed, and tasted gets completely digested, or whatever else internally belonging to oneself is fire, fiery, and clung to. That is called the internal fire element. Now both the internal fire element and the external fire element are simply fire element, and that should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom thus. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. When one sees it thus, as it actually is, with proper wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with the fire element and makes the mind dispassionate towards the fire element. What, bhikkhu, is the air element? The air element may be either internal or external. What is the internal air element? Whatever internally belonging to oneself is air, airy, and clung to. That is, upgoing winds, downgoing winds, Winds in the belly, winds in the bowels, winds in winds that course through the limbs, in breath and out breath, or whatever else internally belonging to oneself is air, airy, and clung to. This is called the internal air element. Now both the internal air element and the external air element are simply air element, and that should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom thus. This is not mine, this I am not. This is not myself. When one sees it thus, as it actually is with proper wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with the air element and makes the mind dispassionate towards the air element. Only one question. Uh, in all of these elements, there seems to be the condition of belonging to oneself and clung to. And I was just wondering, uh, even if it's not belonging and not clung to, not clung to, it's still the elements. Uh, like it, this condition of being clung to is is it? Uh, and yeah, I think clung to here gives the sense that it is internal. It's part of you. Like it's my body. So it's what's inside the body is mine. You you should take it as yours. That's why it says clung to. As opposed to things outside your body, you don't cling to them as yours or yourself. Well, that's not true. You can cling to external things as well. Um, but but what you could say is that um, I mean you're right in another in another way because even if you cling to you you, you believe or you perceive yourself to be clinging to something external, it's still one of the the one of the uh, kandas. You're still actually only clinging. So saying that these are the things that are clung to means that this is actually what you're clinging to. Like when you cling to food, like I'm really addicted to food, you might say. You're not actually addicted to the food. You're addicted to experiences which are made up of the five aggregates. So you're actually addicted to the five aggregates. That's kind of, I think, the point of saying that these are the things that are clung to. That what you're clinging to is actually just the elements. And that's what's so powerful about these simple statements. Is that it's saying this thing that you are are perceiving as being so attractive is just fire element or air element or earth element. 
No, I meant to say, like, uh, even if it's not clung to, it, 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 it's like a, there is not a condition for it to be called an element if it is clung to, is my point. If it's not clung to, it's still called the element, right? Like, let's say an arahant would not cling to, but uh, he would still have water element, etc. Right. Yes. Yeah, but uh, this uh, uh, sermon is given to somebody who is uh, still uh, Putukujana, so he can relate to it when say clung to, not uh, given to an arhat. Thank you. What Biko is the space element? The space element may be either internal or external. What is the internal space element? Whatever internally belonging to oneself is space, spatial and clung to. That is the whole, that is the horse of the ears, the nostrils, the doors of the mouth, and the aperture whereby what is eaten, drunk, consumed, and tasted gets swallowed, and where it collects, and whereby it is excreted from below or whatever else internally belonging to oneself is space spatial and clung to. This is called the internal space element. Now both the internal space element and the external space element are simply space element. And that should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom thus. This is not mine, this is this I am not, this is not myself. When one sees it Thus, as it actually is with proper wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with the space element and makes the mind dispassionate towards the space element. 19. Then there remains only consciousness, purified and bright. Note 1273 MA. This is the sixth element which remains in, in that it has yet to be expounded by the Buddha and penetrated by Pukusati. Here it is explained as the consciousness that accomplishes the work of insight, con insight contemplation on the elements. Under the heading of consciousness, the contemplation of feeling is also included. What does one recognize with that consciousness? One recognizes this is pleasant. One recognizes this is painful, one recognizes this is neither painful nor pleasant. Independence on independence on a contact to be felt as pleasant, there arises a pleasant feeling. Note 7, 4. This passage shows the conditional, conditionality of feeling and its impermanence through the cessation of condition cessation of its condition. When one feels a pleasant feeling, one understands, I feel a pleasant feeling. One understands with the cessation of that same contact to be felt as pleasant. Its corresponding feeling, the pleasant feeling that arose in dependence on that uh, contact to be felt as pleasant, ceases and subsides. In dependence on a contact to be felt as painful, there arises a painful feeling. When one feels a painful feeling, one understands. I feel painful feeling. One understands with the cessation of that same contact to be felt as painful, its corresponding feeling, the painful feeling that arose in dependence on that contact to be felt as painful, ceases and subsides. In dependence on a contact to be felt as neither painful nor pleasant, there arises a neither painful nor pleasant feeling. When one feels a neither painful nor pleasant feeling, one understands, I feel a neither painful nor pleasant feeling. One understands, with the cessation of the, that same contact to be felt as neither painful nor pleasant, its corresponding feeling, the neither painful nor pleasant feeling that arose in dependence on that contact to be felt as neither painful nor pleasant, ceases and subsides. Bhikkhu, just as from the contact and friction of two fire sticks, heat is generated and fire is produced, and with the separation and disjunction of those two fire sticks, the corresponding heat ceases and subsides. 
so too independence on a contact to be felt as pleasant etc to be felt as painful etc to be felt as neither painful nor pleasant there arises uh, neither painful nor pleasant feeling etc one understands with the cessation of the same contact to be felt as neither painful nor pleasant it is its corresponding feeling etc ceases and subsides subsides number 20 then there remains only equanimity purified and bright malleable wieldy and radiant note 1275 ma identifies this as the equanimity of the fourth jhana according to ma puku sati had already achieved the fourth jhana and had a strong attachment to it the buddha first praises this equanimity to inspire pukusati's confidence uh, then he gradually leads him to the immaterial jhanas and the attainment of the paths and fruits suppose bikku a skilled goldsmith or his apprentice were to prepare a furnace heats up heat up the crucible uh, take some gold with tongs and put it into the crucible uh from time to time he would blow on it from time to time he would sprinkle water over it and from time to time he would just look on the gold would become refined well refined completely refined faultless rid of dross malleable wieldy and radiant then whatever kind of ornament he wished to make from it with a golden chain or earrings or a necklace or a golden garland it would serve his purpose so to be cool then there remains only equanimity purified and bright malleable wieldy and radiant number 21 he understands thus if i were to direct direct this equanimity so purified and bright to the base of infinite space and to develop my mind accordingly then this equanimity of mind supported by that base clinging to it would remain for a very long time note 1276 the senses if he attains the base of infinite space and should pass away while still attached to it he would be reborn in a plane in the plane of infinite space and would live there for the full life span of 20000 eons specified for that plane in the higher three immaterial planes the life span is respectively 40000 eons 60000 eons and 84000 eons end of note if i were to direct this economy it is so purified and bright to the base of infinite consciousness to the base of nothingness to the base of neither perception or non perception and to develop my mind accordingly then this equanimity of mind supported by that base clinging to it would remain for a very long time 22 he understands thus if i were to direct this equanimity so purified and bright to the base of infinite space and to develop my mind accordingly this would be conditioned not 1277 ma this is said in order to show the danger in the immaterial jhanas by the one phrase this would be con- conditioned he shows even though the life span there is 20000 eons that is conditioned fashioned built up it is thus impermanent unstable not lasting transient it is subject to perishing breaking up and dissolution it is involved with birth aging and death grounded upon suffering it is not a shelter a place of safety a refuge having passed away there is worldling one can still be reborn in the four states of deprivation if i were to direct this equanimity so purified and bright to the base of infinite cons- consciousness to the base of nothingness to the base of 
neither perception nor non perception and to develop my mind accordingly this would be conditioned he does not form any condition or generate any volition tending towards either being or non being not 1278 so neva abhisankaroti nabhisang tantati bhava bhavaya va vibhavaya the two words suggest the notion of volition as a constructive power that builds up the continuation of conditioned existence ceasing to will for either being or non being shows the extinction of craving for external existence and annihilation culminating in the attainment of arhant shit since he does not form any condition of or generate any volition tending towards either being or non being he does not cling to anything in this world when he does not cling he is not agitated when he is not agitated he personally attains nibbana he understands thus birth is destroyed the holy life has been lived what had to be done has been done there is no more coming to any state of being not 1279 M A says that at this point, Tukusati penetrated three paths and fruits, becoming a non-returner. He realized that his teacher was the Buddha himself, but he could not express his realization since the Buddha still continued with his discourse. If he feels a pleasant feeling, note twelve eighty, this passage shows the arahants abiding in the. in the nibbana element with a residue remaining of the factors of conditioned existence sa upa disessa nibbana dattu though he continues to experience feelings he is free from lust towards pleasant feeling from aversion towards painful feeling and from ignorance about neutral feeling and no he understands it is impermanent there is no holding to it there is no delight in it if he feels a painful feeling he understands it is impermanent there is no holding to it there is no delight in it if he feels a neither painful nor pleasant feeling he understands it is impermanent there is no holding to it there is no delight in it if he feels a pleasant feeling he feels it detached if he feels a painful feeling he feels it detached if he feels a neither painful nor pleasant feeling he feels it detached when he feels a feeling terminating with the body he understands i feel a feeling terminating with the body when he feels a feeling terminating with life he understands i feel a feeling terminating with life note 1281 that is he continues to experience feeling only as long as the body with its life faculty continues but not beyond that and no he understands on the dissolution of the body with the ending of life all that is felt not being delighted in will become cool right here note 1282 this refers to his attainment of the nibbana element with no re- residue remaining anupa disetha nibbana datu the cessation of all conditioned existence with his final passing away and no biku just as an oil lamp burns in dependence on oil and a wick and when the oil and wick are used up if it does not get any more fuel it is extinguished from lack of fuel so too when he feels a feeling terminating with the body a feeling terminating with life he understands i feel a feeling terminating with life he understands on the dissolution of the body at the ending of life all that is felt not being delighted in will become cool right here therefore a bhikkhu possessing this wisdom possesses the supreme foundation of wisdom for this bhikkhu is the sub- is the supreme noble wisdom namely the knowledge of the destruction of all suffering note 1283 This completes the exposition of the first foundation which began at paragraph 
M.A. says that the knowledge of the destruction of all suffering is the wisdom pertaining to the fruit of arahantship. End note. His deliverance being founded upon truth is unshakable, for that is false pico, what has a deceptive nature, and what is true, which has an undeceptive nature, nibbana. Therefore, a bhikkhu possessing this truth possesses the supreme foundation of truth. For this bhikkhu is the supreme noble truth, namely nibbana, which has an undeceptive nature. Formerly, when he was ignorant, he undertook and accepted acquisitions. Note 1284. M.A. mentions four kinds of acquisitions, upadi. Here, see number 674. Now he has abandoned them, cut them off at the root, made them like a palm stump, done away with them so that they are no longer subject to future arising. Therefore, a bhikkhu possessing this relinquishment possesses the supreme foundation of relinquishment. For this bhikkhu, is the supreme noble relinquishment, namely the relinquishment of all acquisitions. Formerly, when he was ignorant, he experienced covetousness, desire, and lust. Now he has abandoned them, cut them off at the root, made them like a palm stump, done away with them so that they are no longer subject to future rising. Formerly, when he was ignorant, he experienced anger, ill will, and hate. Now he has abandoned them, cut them off at the roots, made them like a palm stump, done away with them so that they are no longer subject to future arising. Formerly, when he was ignorant, he experienced ignorance and delusion. Now he has abandoned them, cut them off at the root, made them like a palm stump done away with them so that they are no longer subject to future arising. Therefore, a bhikkhu possessing this peace possesses the supreme foundation of peace. But this bhikkhu is the supreme noble peace, namely the pacification of lust, hate, and delusion. 29. So it was with reference to this that it was said, and should not neglect wisdom, should preserve truth, should cultivate relinquishment, and should train for peace. Tides of conceiving do not sweep over one who stands upon these foundations. And when the tides of conceiving no longer sweep over him, he is called a sage of peace. Paul 95 says, The tides of conceiving, Manu Sawa, as the following paragraph will show our thoughts and notions of origi- and notions originating from the three roots of conceiving, craving, conceit, and views. For a fuller explanation, CN6, the sage of peace, Ni Santo, is the Arhat. So what was said, and with reference to what was this said? Thank you. I am is conceiving. I am this is conceiving shall be, is a conceive, sorry, is a conceiving, I am this, is a conceiving, I shall be, is a conceiving, I shall not be, is a conceiving, I shall be possessed of form, is a conceiving, I shall be formless, is a conceiving, I shall be percipient, is a conceiving, I shall be non-percipient, is a conceiving, I shall be neither percipient nor non-percipient, is a conceiving. Conceiving is a disease, conceiving is a tumor, conceiving is a dart. Overcoming all conceivings, Bhikkhu, <clears throat> one who one is called a sage at peace. And the sage at peace is not born, does not age, does not die, is not shaken, and does not yearn. There is nothing present in him by which he might be born. <clears throat> 1286 says, that which is not present in him is craving for being, which leads those who have not eradicated it back to a new birth following death. Not being born, how could he age? Not aging, how could he die? Not dying, 
How could he be shaken? Being shaken, why should he yearn? So it was with reference to this that it was said, the tides of conceiving do not sweep over anyone who stands upon these foundations. And when the tides of conceiving no longer sweep over him, he is called a sage at peace. Bhikkhu, bear in mind this brief exposition of the six elements. Thereupon the venerable Pukasati thought, indeed, the teacher has come to me, the sublime one has come to me, the fully enlightened one has come to me. Then he rose from his seat, arranged his upper robe over one shoulder, and prostrating himself with his head at the blessed one's feet, he said, Venerable sir, a transgression overcame me, in that like a fool, confused and blundering. I presume, the, I presume to address the blessed one as friend. Venerable sir, may the blessed one forgive my transgression seen as such for the sake of restraint in the future. Surely, Bhikkhu, a transgression came over you, overcame you, in that like a fool, confused and blundering, you presume to address me as a friend. But since you see your transgression as such and make amends in accordance with the Dharma, we forgive you. For it is growth in the noble one's discipline when one sees one's transgression as such, makes amends in accordance with the Dharma, and undertakes restraint in the future. Venerable Sir, I would receive the full admission under the Blessed One. But are you are your bowl and robes complete, Bhikkhu? Venerable Sir, my bowls are Bowl and robes are not complete. Bhikkhu, the targeters do not give the full admission to anyone whose bowl and robes are not complete. Then the venerable Pukusati, having delighted and rejoiced in the Blessed One's words, rose from his seat and after paying homage to the Blessed Ones, keeping him on his right, he departed in order to search for a bowl and robes. Then while the Venerable Pukusati was searching for a ball and robes. A stray cow killed him. Then a number of vikus went to the Blessed One, and after paying homage to him, they sat down at one side and told him, Venerable Sir, the clansman Pukusati, who was given brief instruction by Blessed One, has died. What is his destination? What is his future course? Because the clansman Pukusati was wise, he practiced in accordance with the Dhamma and did not trouble me in the interpretation of the Dhamma. With destruction of the five lower fetters, the clansman Pukusati has reappeared spontaneously in pure abodes and will attend final Nibbana there without ever returning from that world. Note 1287. MS says that he was reborn in pure abode called Abiha and attained Arhanship as soon as he took rebirth there. It quotes a verse from the Subhikta Nikaya 150 I 35, mentioning Pukusati was one of seven bhikkhus who were reborn in Abiha and attained deliverance by transcending the celestial bonds. That is what the, the Blessed One said. The vikus were satisfied and delighted in Blessed One's words. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Sadhu, even though it, to some extent it's, they say, they point out that it's directed to the audience. It seems to be such a, a good audience to give a very sort of deep, directed, and profound teaching. The uh, the question that the edit that you had, uh, I mean, it, it does explain it as you see through the sutta about those four things. Um, but there's kind of a sense of us understanding, or the audience, or or anyone understanding that without any knowledge of the Buddha's teaching, they're already important, but this is how you really, for example, guard the truth. So guarding the truth, we, you, everyone would agree, well, yeah, that's important. You shouldn't get um, caught up in manipulation or lies or deception. But how do you truly do it? You truly do it by uh, giving up the things that are truly deceptive, and that's the things that appear to be stable, satisfying, and controllable. And chaga, chaga can be used uh, to describe uh, generosity, 
like charity, the giving, but uh, the true giving is the giving up. Chaga is relinquishing. And when and for example, Bukusati had, had given up a lot by going forth, but the true giving up, of course, is the giving up of attachment. And then the peace, well, we talk about the importance of peace, but true peace comes from the absence of the defilements. If you still have the defilements, no matter what else, you still can't say you're at peace. Maybe bears mentioning that uh, the noting of the stomach is uh, explained as being related to the four elements, as mentioned here. The the wyo datu, where it says the, the the air element in the in the belly, in the abdomen, because that would have been something that would have been identified by a, a meditator meditators, which the Buddha was a part where. You notice that there's the tension in the belly, and that's the air element in the belly, in the stomach, the abdomen. And so it's a way of describing anapanasati, because that's, in another, another way, that's what it actually is. But describing it uh, in terms of in terms that can be vipassana, in terms of uh, ultimate reality, because it's usually recognized in the commentaries as samatha, anapanasati is samatha, like what Pukusati had practiced. So the anapanasati that he had practiced would have not been vipassana. But uh, there's some sense that anapanasati is broader and is used for vipassana as well. So this is a way of, of technically describing how that works. But something that is vipassana, is anapanasati can also be vipassana. But it's because it's not technically anapanasati. It's technically the four elements, or the, the air element, the tension element, pressure. Pai asked in the chat, what's wrong with addressing the Blessed One as a friend? And is is it bad to call a monk friend? I would say it's probably not appropriate for a lay person to address a monk that way. It's a little bit different from friend. Um, it was just a too familiar. It's kind of an on-level uh, appellation, but that's not that's not the same as addressing the Buddha in that way. It, it, I think it's a little bit overblown, and it's just because this is a standard, right? A standard uh, response when someone says they have uh, they have a transgression. It's just a standard response to say a transgression has overcome you. But like you think, well, why doesn't the Buddha say, "Oh, it's no big deal"? Because it's not really that big of a deal. It's not that big of a deal because he didn't know it was the Buddha. But it's just a standard response. When someone has a transgression, they made a mistake. You just say, or the Buddha, the Buddha would just say. Yeah, I mean, when you, go, on it. when you go see the monk, when you interact with the monks, you don't, you don't just ask, hey, what's up, buddy? <laughs> like, don't speak like... Uh, it's Some a, people do actually, but uh, that's disrespectful. A Buddhist shouldn't. It's, there should be. I mean, it's not the same as a, for a monk. If your question about about it towards a monk, it's not that big of a deal because monks are not the Buddha. But you should never do that to the Buddha. Is really the point. It's just not uh, not to your benefit because it depreciates such a such a power, such a priceless thing. Buddha is an object of veneration to be respected sort of that okay. uh, that he acknowledges that he made the mistake of not not recognizing the buddha not being able to see the buddha and the buddha is right in front of you not realizing it so and so it's clearly it's, it's quite possible that it's because of his preoccupation with summit to practice that he was too focused on his own attainments his own his own peace of mind that he wasn't really paying that close attention to the experiences that would have allowed him to understand, oh, this is the Buddha in front of me, certainly. That, that can happen with Samatha, that you get kind of a little bit too focused on, you know, too self-absorbed, kind of. So, so similar to when we address our parents, we don't address by name, or we just, we just uh, call by father, or we just call father or mother, or we just say, sir, when addressing the father. Bante, it, it is disrespectful, right, to as a lay person, call a monk or our teacher, like, you're my friend or something. That's very disrespectful, right? 
Well, again, though, it's not abuso doesn't quite mean friend. It doesn't actually mean friend at all. It's it's not literally, as I understand what the word means whatsoever. But I'm but, just asking if us, we just, you know, take you as a, or take us like our teacher is like, oh, Bante is my friend or something. Well, That's there's a couple of things. There's a couple of things there, like, um, you know, uh, there's a, you make you should make a distinction between a monk and a teacher. The person who is your teacher is is on quite another level than just uh, a monk who you happen to know. So there's a couple of things that, funny enough, uh, the teacher is more of the friend than the monk. So a monk that you know as a lay person, by virtue of them being a monk, they should not be your friend. There should be a distance. That's something that is that makes things awkward when. Lay people seem to think that they can be buddy buddy with monks, and we have to be very careful not to uh, to be in, put in that position because we're never going to be able to keep our training if we get uh, pulled into the, the lay life. People who who have you know who are living the lay life and have uh, much more contact with society, it's so easy to get pulled in and distracted and caught up in chatting and enjoyment you you lose sight of, of your monkhood by getting too caught up so anyway we were very careful and then when lay people think oh yeah we're, we're gonna sit around and be friends with the monks it's it's a little bit awkward and sometimes they get uh, disappointed as far as the teacher the teacher is a different kind of friend the buddha actually used that the buddha the buddha is our best friend in a sense the the, the good friend the giver of meditation the Kalyanamitta is uh, the te the teacher is your 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 Kalyanamitta your best friend, so it, it, that's just used to to refer to how friendly it is, how kind it is for someone to teach, or how how you should be grateful, and how you should appreciate, and uh, the way you should perceive your teacher as being oh yes this is someone who I should. It's not so much about being grateful or or revering or something like that, but uh, should t take advantage of it. You should understand what a what a that this is someone you should pay attention to. This is someone who has your welfare. If they are actually teaching the Buddhist teaching, then you just think of it as being well. This is someone who has my 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 welfare in in their who's inclined towards my welfare, and so it's it's meant to remind the person to pay attention and to go to that person, right? It's not a good friend. The person who invites you out to drink is the point. That's not the, the really good friend, the one who invites you out to the bar. The good friend, the one you should cultivate, the one you should hang out with, is the one that teaches you meditation. So it's just saying it's the best of friends or it's the friend that you should pay attention to. That's really what it's referring to. So that's how friend works. But the friendship that you're talking about is about more about the equality, honestly. You cannot put your teacher on the same level. It's really against the tradition, against the structure. You have to put your teacher above you. And that's, of course, for cultivating respect so that you respect the teachings, so that you take them seriously and you don't just shrug them off or ignore them or forget about them because you're not taking them seriously. There, I mean, there is issues of, you know, being grateful. Don't don't waste the teacher's time or argue with them or that sort of thing or debate or joke with them or chat with them or, or you know, generally uh, make it harder for them to teach, make it more wearisome for them to teach because they're doing you a favor by teaching. So, yeah, friend, friendship, buddy-buddy kind of friendship is not appropriate and you really shouldn't see your teacher as equal the point being it's not about the person it's about the station so you might see the you should see the person as kind of equal you know they're just another being but at this moment they're in the position of being my teacher and in that station like when you're at school there's a formality to it in the west we're pretty bad at this but uh, you can ask sanka how how you know you're supposed to treat your teacher when you're in school, they are like God in some ways. And you, you treat them with respect because of their position. Yeah, like we are supposed to stand up when the teacher comes. 
Should this is the thing. thing. You really should stand up when your teacher comes into the room. Well, that's for monks, actually, I think. I, I think lay people don't have to worry so much. But in Sri Lanka, they do. It's quite heartening. When monks walk into the room, everybody stands up. Um, I mean, I I think in the end of the day, even if you are, uh, you know, you are the teacher, um, um, in the end of the day, you are still just a, a, so a monk, right? Not just a monk, a monk. Uh, and we are not on equal levels <clears throat> at all. Well, I don't like to think of monks as being on a higher level personally. I, I don't, I mean, there's something to it probably, but I not really. I am, I like to think of monks as being separate. So it's the friendship there is not about them being on a higher level. It's about them having to maintain their distance for the training purposes. Monks get into a lot of trouble by thinking they're superior. And, and that's a real danger that you find. Monks can get a real chip on their shoulder, which they shouldn't have. You're well, a bum. You're a beggar. The word bhikkhu was meant to dissuade. That was meant to remind the monks, you guys are beggars. You're mendicants. You're wearing rags. You're actually lower than all of these people. You're 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 debasing yourself. You're humiliating yourself by wearing cast off rags and calling yourself a bhikkhu. So it's much more about we're to remind ourselves that we're worthless, but uh, but um, we're to we're we're cast we're cast off. We have been we're like garbage that has been refused by society or no that we have been, we have thrown ourselves away and so we have to stay separate we and for for the training purposes we have to keep ourselves separate and that's the reason for not being friends not i'm above you and you can never be my friend because you're below me i mean i strongly disagree from what what, what you were just saying i i feel like uh, a monk uh, decides uh, that I'm going to walk the holy life. Like, that's a huge dedication. Yeah, but the holy life is about realizing that you're worthless, realizing that there is no worth in being reborn yeah, or in, in this body or in this mind. They are not things to be clung to. So the training is very much about not holding yourself above anyone. It's very, very dangerous, of course. That's on the monk, right? That that's that's the monk's problem. He has to check himself on on yeah. this. But uh, so us, yeah, so what you the, the good people, of what you're saying is yeah, people are, appreciate or respect, but the way they should respect it in my mind is still as uh, giving them the separation, not well, putting them up on a pedestal. It's ridiculous because monks can be so awful as well. Monks can be full of corruptions. You shouldn't just put them above you just because they're a monk. But you should give them the distance. You shouldn't get involved. And even if a monk is terrible, you shouldn't get too caught up with that unless they're being terrible to lay people. Don't go and criticize, hey, this monk is not practicing. Hey, this monk is not. That's none of your business. They're, they're not part of your society. Just leave them alone. I mean, there is some connection. You leave them alone mostly. But there are connections that lay people have. You, you either offer food or don't offer food. And if you don't offer food because they're bad monks, well, that's good because it, it uh, makes them wise up and realize that they're just going to starve if they don't. There are ways that, of course, lay people interact with monks. And there's going to be some pretty regular interactions. It's just about regulating those. You shouldn't sit around and chat with the monks. You shouldn't. You can ask how they are and that sort of thing, but it's more about this separation. You shouldn't uh, tell them stories about your grandkids or that sort of thing. I mean, you, it, it's really uh, better to leave the monks alone is the point. So I have heard that when it comes to uh, interacting with lay people, uh, monks are advised to do it like uh, when you are looking into a deep well in the ground a well without fences that you can fall into. You are looking into it to see whether it has water. You look yeah. into it carefully without letting yourself slip into it. Well, if it has the connotations that they're beneath us and we're, we're up above, that's still problematic in my mind. I don't, I don't buy into the monks are 
are above lay people. The monastic life is superior, and there's a superiority there. So there's a, there's something to it, but it really isn't how we should look at it. Much better in my mind is just giving monks their space and appreciating what they're doing, like revering them from afar kind of thing. In that in that analogy, I think it is stressing on being careful, like not to slip in the <laughs> slip into lay ways yeah. of the lay people. Yeah. yeah, it's a good analogy. I agree. Yeah, I just remember that maybe a lay practitioner could be much more advanced in their spiritual path or even enlightened. Uh, and not all monks uh, were. You were saying, I keep forgetting for some reason that but, uh, there but, are crappy monks as well. <laughs> Sorry. But you can you can bow uh, down to a monk because of your reverence for the monkhood, for the, the monastic hmm. training that the Buddha laid down. I mean, it's just, you see a monk and you're seeing something the Buddha created. So it's like you're bowing down to the Buddha, the kind of the idea. So in form, there is a lot of very strong respect shown to the monastic tradition. In practice, it really doesn't hold up because lay people will yell at monks or criticize monks. Or the, the, the point to be stressed, I think, is they shouldn't get too caught up and involved with the monks. At the end of the sasana, monks will become like lay people who are just wearing yellow mm -hmm. threads around their wrists. But even if you give yeah. a dana to such a monk or whatever form they are, yeah, and uh, you dedicate it to the sangha, you still get high merits from that. Yeah, um, I just I just wanted to, to mention one day I uh, I heard the Dharma talk and it just really hit me uh, the whole thing how. The Sangha, the bhikkhus uh, and the bhikkhunis uh, just kept all the teachings alive and uh, how it all, like everyone had their teacher and 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 it goes back to the Arahants and it goes back right to the Buddha. So this is whatever we are hearing or I am hearing and uh, I'm practicing, it, it comes from almost directly from the Buddha. It said there is no, there is always a chain, a uh, teacher-student mm -hmm. chain between. Yeah, the monks in the present are a representation of the great monks, the, the Buddha and the great monks in the past. Yeah, yeah, it, it's just incredible how we are still in kind of a t in touch with, with the whole original Sangha. One thing about um, reverence is it does provide the, it does help maintain the separation. Like when you hold the monks high up, it, as people often do, it does create the separate, help maintain the separation. When people are bowing to you and holding, holding their hands up and praising, you know, like revering you, it holds you up to a higher higher level of behavior as well and makes it hard to create these uh, inappropriate bonds of familiarity. So when people stop doing that reverence, that they start getting buddy-buddy with the monks and trouble can arise, especially if it's between male monks and uh, male monks and female lay people, or yeah. bikunis and uh, yeah, heterosexual I... problems. Yeah, I was just thinking that, like, if if you don't have that in your mind, that that barrier, like, really strong barrier, like, mm -hmm. you no, know, he's higher, and he's, then you're in trouble for sure. Yeah, so it works, but again, it can lead to conceit for the monks. That's their problem. <laughs> In the sutta, so it goes to the consciousness element, that we, which is the sixth, right? And he is explaining the consciousness element through the feeling. And then that I get. But then how in the paragraph 20, it says, or he says that 
then there remains only equanimity. So is that still connected to, I mean, it is connected to chitta, right? The, the consciousness. So is that still the explanation of the consciousness element, the equanimity part? I think it's going further. No, I don't think it's the sixth element. I think it's going further with regards to wisdom. So he's talked about the six elements and now he's going to explain how wisdom arises. Uh, it's it's kind of, um, I mean, the commentary implies that there's sort of this guiding and manipulating the mind of the audience, that this is what specifically Pukusati needs to hear because of his attachment to equanimity. So he he uses this mention of equanimity to pique his interest and to make it relatable so that he's able to guide him from the equanimity that he's probably feeling by having practiced the jhana, the samatha jhana, to bring him to vipassana understanding. Yeah, because once you're in the jhanas, the, the, the experiences talked about in uh, paragraph 19, they don't arise. I mean, there's no feeling on the body, there's no hearing, especially in the fourth jhana. So those are subsided. And according to the analogy, the purified gold is uh, the equanimity of, of the fourth jhana here. And based on uh, using that gold, you can make different objects. So like using the fourth jhana, based on the fourth jhana, you attain the arupa jhanas. Sure. So why was it important to also direct his mind towards the arupa jhanas? The natural well, progression from there, you, I mean, it's a higher version of the fourth jhana. Like you keep uh, strengthening the fourth jhana, going up on level. And at the end, yeah. uh, I I just I just don't see how was that important for the um, it's eradication like, uh, of defilement. Because so uh, if you are attached to the fourth jhana, uh, if you so if you show the person something higher than that, which is the first tarupa jhana, you can trans uh, transition him from the fourth jhana to that level, and then the next level you can go like that, and then after the neva sanya na sanya, then you uh, direct him to nibbana. It's like step by step uh, process. It's not mm-hmm. directly saying, okay, you abandon this, and then you. Practice vipassana. So I guess if someone clings to meditation and jhana itself, then you have to take them through these uh, because they already kind of found something that's um, happiness, right? And they can perceive it as uh, satisfactory. It depends on the person, I guess. If a person is more into the Jhanas, Samatha Jhanas, then probably that's the way. But it's not necessary. Like if the person is is able to convert that way to Vipassana, you don't have to go that way. It's probably, it probably depends on the person. Basically, these higher Jhanas could be a trap, right? Attaining them first. That's, I don't think they'd be a trap. I mean, even Arhants, after becoming Arhants, they do practice Jhana to be able to attain, attain the Nirodha Samapatti. But that's different. It's easier for them. The trap is wrong view and where you're clinging. If you don't focus on them or deal with them, then they will trap you in things like jhanas for sure. Yeah, jhana is more like a platform or a tool that you can use for your spiritual development. Because there's so much concentration, it can become hard to face, confront the, the problems, like wrong view and so on. So it can be hard to convince people who are keenly practicing samatha practice to practice vipassana. It can be. It's not because of the samatha. It's because, well, it, it, it can be a challenge because the samatha sort of protects them from the uh, tendencies or the, the, the latent defilements. I'm not saying. I'm not saying. But on the other hand, their hindrances are subdued. So it is also beneficial for the progress. So it- That's true. Yeah, if they use it, if they point in the right direction. But without wisdom, without someone to direct you, like left to your own devices, you're never going to find it. You never think of the things that the, the Buddha explained. Samatha doesn't hint at impermanence. 
So what, what often happens for people who practice samatha is they come to the question of not being able to maintain the tranquility. And so either they try harder and harder or they eventually do realize the futility of it and they start to ask, could there be something better? Usually they don't ask, could it be something better? They say, they usually ask, how can they prevent this from this from happening, this loss of of tranquility that perpetually occurs every time you get distracted suddenly you lose your tranquility and you have to start all over and it's just hard work to upkeep so how do i make it effortless and up and able to be kept and that's where vipassana comes in to tell you you can't that's just not how it works and the seeing that is ultimately valuable more valuable than falling into the trap of thinking that it's permanent lasting safe isn't that also a problem that people uh, compare the experience of samatha with insight meditation? So because samatha is more pleasant, they reject mm. the uh, unpleasantness when they confront, get confronted with insight meditation. Yeah, it makes it far more appealing and uh, makes people question whether there's something wrong with this, this practice because it's not very pleasant. It, it's not that it's not very pleasant. In fact, it's just their defilements make ordinary experience unpleasant because we pass and ideals with experiences as being ordinary. It uh, leads to reaction, which makes it unpleasant. But the real problem is, yeah, thinking that there's something wrong with it as a result. It's okay for it to be unpleasant. It doesn't mean that anything's wrong with the experience it just means that there's reactions which are, it's useful to see useful to appreciate and appreciate the suffering that comes not from the experience but from the reactions it's interesting that uh, uh, in the sutta at the end of the sutta but the buddha didn't give venerable bhikkhusati the ahibhik coordination even though he didn't have ball and rope Probably because uh, the Buddha saw that he's going to die anyways. Because you can't give ehi bhikkhu unless they have their bowl and robes. No, I think I, uh, the way I heard Bhante is like if you have given uh, Atapirikara the eight requisites in the past yes. in Sansara, they, they magically and, float down from the sky. They do, they appear, yeah. but that's you, that's means that they have the bowl and robes, or or you could say at least they have the prerequisite for them to appear. But uh, obviously, Pukusati didn't have that. It's not the magic of a. It's not just by saying a hibiku suddenly makes the ball and robes appear. Buku said he didn't have the the requisite to become a, a monk at all. He had the bad karma of having partaken. I'm, I understand he would have been one of the people who killed this yakini that was born. Ah, yes. This, this, yes, yes. It, was, it wasn't actually a stray cow. It was actually this yakini, this female ogre. And uh, Buku said he wasn't the only one, but she was out to get revenge on these people who had who had, uh, I think, sexually assaulted her, actually. But anyway, brutally murdered. I can't remember the story. The far past life, Bahia was another. I was actually wondering why the Buddha, he knew that this person has the ability to get enlightened. And then he just get up and uh, went to meet him. Like, he, he didn't wait for him. Like, I guess he knew that the... Uh, lifespan will end soon or something like there yeah. had to be some reason yeah the buddha every morning would look out into the universe and see who would be receptive to the teachings because again he had been invited by brahma to teach so he's, he looked out for the people who were right to teach that day and he saw oh pukasati is coming but he won't make it so i have to go to him mm -hmm. I remember a little bit of the story. I think it was about, like Mathe said, uh, he had sex with a woman and then killed the woman afterwards, probably because it was like he wanted to hide it or something in the past life. Well, it was a group of them, I understand. It was pretty nefarious. Can you imagine even Pukkasati had done such bad things in past lives? I mean, he was like, even, even after reading one gold sheet of Dhamma, he decided to become a monk so that how good he was imagine how many bad things we have done in the past <laughs> if that was his character in the present life and still he was so evil in the past imagine how many bad things we have done in the past you never know you when can, they will come to bite you <laughs> you can read the story of Pukasati uh, in the digit in the dictionary of Pali proper names looks like it goes into some as i said there's a the commentary goes into great detail about his past 
So these these teachings that Gimbisara sent included the Satipatthana, the Eightfold Noble Path, 37 Factors of Enlightenment. When he read that, he immediately left. But he thought the Buddha was at Rajagaha, so he just walked right past Savati. He didn't even go to Jetavana because he thought the Buddha was in Rajagaha. The cow that killed Pukusati is said to have been a Yakini, who was a cow in 100 births. In her last birth as a cow, she killed Pukusati, Bahia, Damba, Datika, and Supabuddha, four of them, not five. Uh, so it doesn't mention why why she had it out for them. Yeah, that cow must be in Avicii now, because it killed like the it killed one of the eighty great disciples. Bahi, Venerable Bahi was an Arahant, and he was the fastest to attain enlightenment. Yeah, that so. killed an Arahant. Okay, starting to get much worse than that. Yeah, I, I'm I'm so surprised that Sanka can laugh when he mentions that. Imagine how many bad things we did. And I'm like, just terrified. And he laughs. <laughs> I mean, it's the irony. Even the Buddha, one time, he, when he was going with Venerable Ananda, he saw like a, a ants uh, marching on the ground. And then he told that, I think he smiled. The Buddha smiled. And then Venerable Ananda noticed that the Buddha smiled because uh, whenever the Buddha smiles, he, I think there's... Uh, white light emanating from his teeth. So Venerable Ananda noticed that and then I knew that the Buddha uh, had smiled and asked about the reason. Then he, then the Buddha told about the ants on the road. They had been uh, the universal monarchs. Each ant marching in that uh, line had been universal monarchs in the past, in past yeah. lives. Terrifying, Sanka. That's terrifying. That's terrifying. <laughs> it's the irony. I'm telling you, you don't laugh. Yeah, laughter belongs to the Putukjanas, but uh, the Arahants can smile, hmm. especially about something ironic called the Hasitupada Jitta. I mean, it, it's just when you realize like how many moments of negligence you have in a day. Or in an hour, basically. Like that's I'm not saying that you should feel regretful or anything, but that's honesty, I think. Yep, understanding the uh danger in Sansara is actually considered uh, wisdom. I think one reason why the Buddha did not Buddha concealed his normal appearances was because uh, he didn't want Venerable Pukusada to get overwhelmed or, or starstruck or something like that. So he would listen, he would focus on the sermon than being overwhelmed by the presence of the Buddha. Well, as I understood it, it the reason was that he wanted to get there fast and not being stopped by others, recognized and stopped by others. Yeah, that could be a reason too. All right, that's all for me this week. Thank you all for coming. Have a good week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.